stereotypes, prejudice, and stigma contribute to the discrimination and exclusion experienced by people with disabilities and their families in all aspects of their lives. But what can be done to improve the lives of disabled people on the African continent? That discussion is coming up right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk Africa Live from the Voice of America headquarters here in Washington. I'm Peter Clote sitting in for Shaka Sali. Today we are discussing disability in Africa and what can be done to improve the lives of those who have special needs. The United Nations Day of Persons with Disabilities was marked on December 3rd. An estimated 60 to 80 million people are living with disabilities on the continent. Legal protections and customary practices for disabled Africans vary from country to country. Disabled people in Ghana have had many legal protections since 2006, but they still face many challenges. Viewers Kwame Asante Ofori reports. When I was in our village, I was an idol. I used to sell charcoal, polythene bags. In fact, I loved business. On certain mornings, I could cook gari with beans to sell. It gained me a small allowance, which could bring me to the big city. I was so desperate to come that even if it meant sleeping outside, I would and gradually find something. I didn't know where to go. So I used to sleep on the street to try to find a job or help. Someone said they wanted to sell their small kills. I sought to help and I used whatever I got to buy the kills. That's how I gradually began to grow. When that was done, I started receiving trainees to learn the trade. I have trained so many students who have now graduated from here and are working on their own. They are able to feed themselves. I studied a vocational course, but I didn't get any work. And now I'm on these streets so I can get my daily bread to take care of myself. Or if they can put me in a school, I could teach them. It's a challenge, yeah, for them to compete for jobs. Um, if you, you have a job placement for one person and there are 10 people applying, um, I, I dare stick, stick my neck out that they will pick the one who is so-called normal and leave this one just because of the disability. I believe the understanding of our people on these issues is low. We never think that someone who has a disability would be able to do or achieve what someone considered an abled person could. So indeed, our understanding of things is low. As of now, when the government has passed a law, still now people are in the dark about these issues. They are still treating the disabled badly. They hide them in rooms. Some don't send their kids with disability to school. Even when you are going to look for a job as a person with disability, you are denied because of your situation. We are going to fight on and until we have a policy to employ all persons with disability, especially graduates who have completed struggle and completed university and are in the house. There are incentives for people who employ disabled people. So you have some tax holidays for businesses who decide to employ people who have disability. Now, this is a law, and that's how it's been working. Uh, unless, of course, maybe somebody is ignorant about the law, so that even though you have employed somebody, you have not applied for what is due you, you know, in terms of the tax holidays and incentives that I've talked about, you know, but that is the position of the law. Now joining us today in Washington is Presla Rodriguez, Associate Director for Advocacy of Disability Rights International. 
Imuatinian Ugiagbe, a visual storyteller who is visually impaired in Los Angeles. We are joined by Susan Quizera, founder of the New Life Autism Foundation in Uganda. And from Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, we are joined by Berahanu Tefera Gizau, executive director of the African Disability Forum. Kwame Ufori also joins us. Welcome and thank you for joining us on Straight Talk Africa today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for having us. So let me come to you, Imuatenya. Tell me about your experience um, ah. living with uh, disability, particularly in Nigeria. Okay, so born and raised in Nigeria, um, I was born with cataracts, and cataract is basically the clouding of the lenses in the eyes. Um, and so my first eye operation was done at the age of six, and the second one was done at the age of 12 before moving to the U.S. at 14. Um, at the age of six, um, because my eyes are open, and when it comes to disability, there are two types. There are visible and invisible. So mine is not obvious, and so it's very difficult for people to know that I have this issue. Um, so growing up, my parents didn't really know at first. Um, and when I started going to school, that became an issue because there were notes sent. Teachers would send notes home to my parents um, complaining about my lack of participation in school. Um, and so it was very tough because nobody wants to claim that there was something wrong um, when they, you know, if, in terms of like dealing with the issue at first. So teachers would, you know, I went through a period where teachers would beat me several times when they asked me to, you know, you know, call out what's on the board and stuff like that. When I wasn't able to do that, they would flog me several times on the head. Um, they would send notes to my parents. Um, at first, um, my father particularly did not want to believe um, because I understand the taboo in Africa particularly. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of struggle as a child dealing with that kind of situation, yeah. Mm. Let me come to you, Kwame. You, yeah. you had this nice report from the beginning of the show. Yeah. How challenging was it to get these people to openly talk to you, knowing the cultural perspective surrounding it, some of these it, issues? It was quite challenging because even walking on the streets trying to find, you know, we spoke to Joe Abani, who is a blind beggar on the streets of Accra. Before we spoke to Joe, we, we saw other people who were also disabled. Just having them come on camera to talk was very, very difficult because they, they feel like they've been neglected for so long. Why all of a sudden, why do you want to talk to me? What are you going to talk to me about? Where are you taking this to? And you can't blame them too much because if you've been neglected for so long, that is the kind of stigma that, stigmatization that you've been through. It, it, it leaves a lasting impression on your mind. So even when someone wants to talk to you about an issue, you just distance yourself. If I may ask, you talked about the, those living with disabilities having yes. protections from the government. Yes. Law. Yes. By law since 2006. So mm -hmm. why hasn't there been an enforcement to ensure these laws work for the people living with disabilities, particularly in Ghana? That, that, that question would best use the government of Ghana, really. But personally, I, I feel it's... It's, part, it's a cultural thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, we've, we've passed the law, it's beautiful, we've written it, okay, yay, hooray. But when it comes to enacting the law, that is where the problem is because these agencies really, I, I feel it's like a, it's a, it's a back bench for most of them. They're like, okay, yeah, we understand people with disabilities live with us here in the country, but, um, you know, they can deal with themselves and then we think about other pertinent issues. So I think that is what is causing this. Once they start to realize people with disabilities are equal to them, I think people will begin to enact the law and then, you know, straighten it out. All right. And then let me come to you. Um, talk to me about your advocacy work in both Uganda and in Rwanda, if I may ask. Um... My advocate on this is uh, coming together as people who are in this field and speaking on behalf of these children. And my advocate has been pushing the government to introduce uh, the policy for the disability children, uh, especially the autism uh, I'm working with because it shows that um, these children, like everybody has said, uh, they have been de neglected. And when the government cannot come up to help us to establish um, uh, res resources or um, education, uh, emphasize and training teachers, then we cannot do it. 
So um, I really uh, believe that uh, with the help of the government and us people who are in this field, parents, uh, teachers, a therapist come together and push it and speak on behalf of uh, children with disability in Africa. But Susan, how is your advocacy work changing perception of prejudice, stigma, among other issues that people living with disabilities face in your region of work? Um, I started the program in, in Uganda, uh, New Life Foundation, uh, for uh, autism and I've seen it working the more we go out and speak about it the more we speak to the parents we yes we are seeing a big change and uh, it's from that point that we are reaching out to the government uh, uh, and and tell them what they have to do most of them don't even know what autism is but there are so many other disabilities, the blind, the deaf, but autism particularly has been uh, ignored. So my advocate, it's not me alone. There are other people. We are working as a team. We are knocking at the doors. You know, uh, right now, actually, we, we have petitioned the, 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 the parliament. We need them to hear us. We need to... To, to express uh, these children. We need to speak, be the, the, the voice to these children. So my advocate and other people, I really believe that with us pushing it, speaking, the government is going to intervene. Mm. But what has been the response of those in government so far, particularly the parliamentarian speakers of, of parliament in the region, parliamentarians individually interacting with you, to grant you what you seek, uh, some protections for people with uh, disabilities? I believe uh, right now, like I said, we have not gotten the feedback from them, but we are hoping and believing that something is going to be done because they have given us the platform, you know. So we are waiting to see what they have to do about it, especially in education because everything begins with education. And we are struggling because of the lack of early childhood intervention, mostly in all Africa, not Uganda alone, but Africa as a continent. So we are pushing the Minister of Education to at least you know, uh, introduce the early childhood intervention. If all schools in Africa have trained teachers you know, in special needs children, then I think there's going to be a change. Thank you very much, Susan. Martin, let me come to you. Yes, in some places in Africa, um, I know there are homes, they call them cripples' home, or people with, living with disabilities, they went to school sponsored by the government. In your experience, growing up, some of the challenges you face, is it changing now? Um, there have been lots of changes, I mean, um, happening, but it's not as drastic. Um, and when it comes to disability, my particular, um, I guess, advice that I would say is a lot of education. Um, when, you know, Africa, we're very big on religion. I mean, this is something that a church can also be a part of. Um, and so for you to have that kind of impact in a community or in a society, rather, you have to make sure that implementation goes across the board. So starting with the church, which takes a lot of, you know, has a lot of audience. So I feel like um, when it comes to educating the minds or ed educating parents first about your children and, and, the, um, and the, uh, the disability that they have, it's first accepting that the, the children has that kind of disability first. Mm -hmm. And then with acceptance, then you have the necessary step to, um, in terms of what you can do to help the child. I mean, it's, it's changing, but it's not, it's not as quick as we would like it to. Mm. Um, and that has a lot to do with, um, of course, cultural you know, uh, uh, stagnant and, and then um, lack of government resources. And my personal experience, there weren't resources available for me at all. Mm -hmm. um, I went to a private school starting off. Um, there were no larger prints. There were no um, Zoom texts. There were no teachers had no idea and so for you to constantly beat a child up um, because they can't do what you're making them to do, it's like you're, putting the you're actually making them go through trauma. Mm -hmm. So for that childhood, for 14 years of my life, was just full of just that trauma. So I think we can do more, we can do better, but um, it has to be a combination of everybody. 
um, and for it to work. And that's what I purely believe. Susan, let me, let me come to you. What do you think are the other driving factors of some of these myths about people living with disabilities? What is what again? I'm asking what are the other core drivers behind the behavior of people uh, having some apprehension and some uh, concerns about people living with disabilities? Because from Kwame's report, it appears that they don't even want to hire them in spite of the fact that there are laws protecting them. Yeah, um, I believe stigma is uh, a, a big you know, uh, thing in especially Africa. Uh, a lot of uh, parents, even those who have money, they don't feel comfortable around these children. They don't feel comfortable walking around with them. And, you know, like Africa, we know it's culture wise, you know, they feel that these children are probably a cuss or, um, or mad, like the way, you know, or they've been uh, bewitched. So those kind of things are. Uh, are making parents not coming out, uh, not being comfortable, not accepting uh, who those children are. And uh, with my experience here in the United States, these children are the same. It's only the, the resources, the way we handle them, the way we take them to be, the way we name them. So things have to change. We need to keep on uh, talking to the parents, uh, bringing the awareness, and creating things, you know, that will make parents believe that, you know what, these children are the same. And we should, to, we, we have to change the, the narrative, you know, the way we think as Africans, the way we do things, you know, we need to, and it's us, us people who have uh, seen these children who have been around them, we are the people who have to keep talking on their behalf and also, uh, talking to the parents because if the parents are not synthesized, then they won't really uh, do much. Hmm. Let me come to you, uh, Berhano, in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Talk to me about your advocacy work, some of the challenges you're facing, and is the government engaging you to address some of the challenges you face? Thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, I can start by uh, stating some of the difficulties that we are facing. Earlier on, when you mentioned uh, the statistics when it comes to the persons living with disability in Africa, you mentioned uh, quite a number. Actually, the reality is much more different. That is the biggest challenge that we are facing. According to the WHO's uh, survey that was done in 2011, around 15 to 17 percent of the African population live people with, are people living with disability. This is a huge number. But when it comes to national censuses, there were no proper way of collecting disaggregated data by disability. That have a lot of consequences. It goes to policy, so that when the government allocates resources with regards to tackling the challenges and the barriers that people with disability are facing, the amount of resource is never enough. And you know the kind of uh, uh, problems that we are facing, be it from the environmental barriers to uh, the mindset of people. So what we are trying to fight now is like going about uh, the proper implementation and the domestication of the UN Convention and how the government have to domesticate the conventions that were signed and ratified by African governments. And this needs a follow-up. Governments need to do reporting on the status of the changes that they are overcoming in a period of time. So what we are trying to do with our member organization from country to country is that to follow up on the different processes, what is happening at the ground and what is not happening. And we do periodical reporting. We do consultation with our uh, member organization and also we create a platform with the government to have further engagement. What we are succeeding is that the governments, including the Ethiopian government and other governments that we are, when we are doing workshops and when we are doing events, they are now willing to sit around the table with organizations of persons with disabilities and their representatives and listen to their real problem.
So if I may ask you, what do you think could be done to change that perception from the government, especially in Ethiopia? Because you talked about the fact that there has been a recent change in government. Has the attitude changed and what do you expect in the coming future? Yes, uh, we are seeing some uh, are good and very like uh, interesting commitments from the government. This comes not only because of the reforms, also because of global commitments that are coming in to support the country and the reforms that's happening in the country to develop uh, a more inclusive uh, engagement mechanisms. So now the government is now actually allocating a seat within the civil society coordination system and uh, with the new civil society law, people with disability and their organizations will have two seats to do continuous advocacy work with the government. This will help us for policy reforms and other uh, advocacy works. Well, what about parents living um, who have children with disabilities? Can they also act as advocates in your drive? Yes, uh, the organizations of persons with disabilities are not only those organizations that are created by people with disability, but mm -hmm. also there are yes. parent organizations. Yes, so you. these organizations, like organizations uh, for supporting children with autism, children with uh, intellectual disability. So there are parent organizations that are engaging in this process. Mm. Thank you very much, Berhanu. Kwame, let me come to you. Sure. Looking forward with the report that you have, mm -hmm. is there any hope for some of these uh, people living with disabilities that you spoke with? At least one of them was saying, I have a business, I'm trading mm -hmm. more people. Mm -hmm. What is the hope? Them. There's definitely hope, but before I even jump into that, I, I need people to understand that it just takes something little for you to become, as they say, disabled. Mm -hmm. You see, and once we understand this and we start preparing our society to be able to accept that, mm -hmm. then things will move forward. Mm -hmm. Because Madame Akosia, who is a hairdresser and a business owner, she became crippled at the age of three through uh, a medical negligence, negligence in the hospital. But she was able to fight through. Her case is peculiar. Not everyone has the chance. Mm -hmm. But imagine a world where we understand that any person can become disabled at any time. Mm -hmm. That means any time policy is being driven, any time laws are being created, any time there's an enforcement, people think in that sense that, hey, it could be me. So why don't I place in the necessary structures for our buildings, for how we relate with people with disabilities. That way, we can all move forward as a people. That, that is the hope to me. Mm. Some people have expressed concern, particularly in Ghana, that even when those laws were enacted, mm -hmm. even government buildings have not been compliant mm -hmm. of those laws that mm -hmm. make it easy mm -hmm. for uh, people living with disabilities mm -hmm. to access those buildings. Yes. Uh, hopefully that could change. But in my tenure, let me come to you. What has been your experience since coming to the state uh, in terms of things that are available to you uh, that you can easily access that you couldn't access back Thank home? Thank you. So, well, let me just go back. So at home, my mother was very, very big on advocacy. My okay. mother was my, um, my voice. Mm -hmm. And so I remember after my second eye surgery, my mother coming to school with me, making sure I was sitting closer to the board. My mother made sure the teachers doesn't flog me or beat me in the head. My mother was just very involved extremely. And um, to this day, I owe so much gratitude to her. Um, because after, like, at the age of eight, I stopped going to school completely because mm -hmm. every time I would go to school, I would fail. I kept repeating classes. So I moved to the U.S. at um, 14. Um, immediately I got to the States, I realized that this is the second ch chance I have to make something out of my life. So I did not read as a child at all um, because I couldn't see textbook. I didn't know um, notebook had lines in them. Um, I can't see rain, I can't see street signs. I mean, I was coming here, my Uber driver dropped me off the wrong location, so I had to figure out how to get here. So there are daily difficulties. Um, but when I got to the U.S., what was amazing was that um, instead of from eighth grade, then I went to high school, so my eyes would always bring out water. So my social study teacher was very concerned about that. So they took me to um, several specialists in Manhattan, which is, I lived in, in New, York New York for a while. Right. Mm -hmm. And then they found out that the surgery they had done, they had taken out the lenses from my eyes and not replaced them. And they had blinded me on the left. So I can't see from my left eye and my right eye just had a little, I can see from a certain distance. Um, so what they did that was amazing was that they, my prints were very large. 
Um, they made sure they read for me. They made sure someone typed my paper. Um, it wasn't that, because growing up, I always thought I was dumb. I wasn't smart enough. Um, but um, when they started providing those resources for me, then it gave me the opportunity to learn. It gave me the opportunity to read. It, it, like, I had to go back and start learning to read. Um, I did not start reading until I was 16. Um, and I did not, comprehension did not begin until 21. So what I learned about my condition is that the eyes and the brain works together. So just because I'm looking at you doesn't necessarily mean I see you. Um, so I had to, so there's a slow process in terms of how I see things. Um, and so um, coming to the U.S. to me was the best gift my father had ever given me because I feel if I had not come that I probably would have been married off with six kids. I mean, that's what the story I tell myself. <laughs> so I think that it is important that parents take part in the development of their child as African. Um, mm -hmm. That if my mother had not come to school with me, uh, if my mother hadn't believed me, then the situation would have been different. Now, I'm going to share one more thing to you. I did a story last year on um, a woman whose daughter had this um, autism. Mm -hmm. And um, the child was fine. And then at the age of, I believe, like or three or something, she st um, stopped responding to things. And the woman went to church for one year. Um, she did all these things. And the, the kid just kept getting, the situation kept getting worse mm -hmm. until finally someone told her, your daughter has autism. And then she didn't even know such thing existed until she accepted. And when she accepted, she started giving the child um, the necessary resources she needed. And now the child is doing fine. You know, so I think it's a, it's a matter of acceptance. And for so long, I did not want to believe because of that stigma. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I did not believe, I suffered greatly. Mm -hmm. I suffered a whole lot. So I think um, believing in acceptance is the, is the key when it comes to a situation like this. And a collective effort of both church, government, people, advocacy, everybody needs to come together and make the necessary change that uh, What about needed. siblings reacting to this? Because sometimes siblings are a little bit confused. <laughs> they don't know what is going on. Um, <laughs> do parents have to explain to them? Um, society sometimes can be a little unforgiving when it comes to that. So <laughs> how are they able to cope My with this My siblings situation? are the best. Okay. I was not because I'm on TV. I'm just saying that. <laughs> They're amazing. So I have a younger sister. I have, mm. I have four. I have a brother who, whenever I go out with him now, he holds my hands. He makes sure I'm okay. He tells me when they, if I need to cross over or stay on the... Like, he's just very... He takes good care of me. I, had a younger, I have a younger sister. Um, I remember when I was kept failing, failing, my mother thought it would be a good idea for my younger sister and I to, to be, be in the same, same class. Right. And so my sister would read to me. Um, I remember the first day of school, the teacher, I was sitting in the front, and my youngest sister was sitting in the back of the class. And the teacher goes, okay, Moitinia, what letter is that? And I couldn't see it because I was um, so afraid to say I couldn't see it. I just kind of sat there quietly. And the teacher goes, oh, Egosa, what, what letter is that? And she goes, C. And then the teacher goes, you're so, you know, she started, you know, insulting me. So my sister would always tell me, don't listen to her. You're smart, Matinya. I'll help you do your homework. So she was, they were always supportive, very, till this day, extremely supportive. Um, and, and I think that it's all about, I guess, love and also education as well. Um, especially from the parents. Parents have a lot of power in terms mm -hmm. of like educating your children. My mother did such an excellent job with that. Yeah. Uh, before we go to the break, what about your father? What role did he play? <laughs> I know he brought you to the U.S., but what about him? I think, Briefly, before we go on yes, the break. Yes, sir. I ahead. think men, forgive me, but men are not, some men rather, don't quickly accept things. Um, um, and I don't know why that is. Um, my father provided money for the surgery, but I felt like the stigma is just very strong with him. So till this day, in my mind, I think he's still having difficulties grasping the fact. Because he said, I don't want to believe it. I don't want to believe it. And because he didn't want to believe it for so long, there's a distance between the two of us when it comes to my eye problem. So I think a lot of fathers need to be involved as well to, to take away the emotional... Um, uh, the emotional neglect of the child because that becomes a problem that that child has to deal with as an adult, which I had to deal with until this day I'm still dealing with it. Mm. You are tuned into Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of our discussion after a short break. We're talking about the news and issues you're talking about, sharing stories of development and growth across Africa, around the world, and in our lives. Topics that inform, empower, and change the rules. It's time for Our Voices with me, Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick, and Hadiza Kiari, and Ayan Bior, and Orion Itangi Shaka. It's time for Our 
voices. Today's youth are not just the next generation of African leaders, they are today's leaders. And this is the time to invest in them. Today, not tomorrow. So let's connect, let's engage with each other on issues that will transform our societies. Innovation, leadership, entrepreneurship, things that you're doing to move the continent forward to make you the greatest generation that Africa has known. It's up front every Wednesday, 1730 UTC, right here on The Voice of America. We appreciate all of the audience feedback. Straight Talk Africa streams live every Wednesday on Facebook. You can watch our show there and leave a comment. Uh, let's look at what's on tap for next week's program. On the next Straight Talk Africa, 2019 has been the year of Ghanaians in the diaspora returning to their roots in their West African homeland. 75% of the slave trade emanated from the Ghanaian coast, and now the country is extending citizenship to foreign nationals. The year of return on the next Straight Talk Africa. Today we are talking about improving the lives of Africa's disabled. Our guest are Priscilla Rodriguez, Associate Director for Advocacy of Disability Rights International. Imuetenya Ugiagbe, a visual storyteller who is visually impaired. In Los Angeles, we are joined by Suzanne Quizera, founder of New Life Autism Foundation in Uganda. And from Addis Ababa, we are joined by Berhanu Tefera Gizao, head of the African Dias Disability Forum. Let me come to you, Priscilla. You, you were listening to the discussion. What are some of the challenges when it comes to some misconceptions some stigma, prejudices about people living with disability. Well, what we found in Kenya, but we've heard also stories uh, throughout Africa, is that children with disabilities and their mothers face a lot of stigma. Their mothers are actually believed to have sinned, and, and the child with a disability is a result of that, and it's a punishment. So when a child with a disability is born, the mother is told, the mother is told you must have been unfaithful, or uh, you, you're, you must be cursed, or and the child is now also a curse. So they face pressure to actually get rid of their child. Uh, DRI, Disability Rights International, conducted a three-year investigation in Kenya, mm -hmm. and we interviewed mothers of children with disabilities, and around 43% said that they were, uh, they were pressured to give up their child, and actually this number was higher in the rural areas, close to 60%. And they were all told that uh, it's because uh, their child is coarse, they are coarse, they are uh, sinners, and um, they need to get rid of the baby so that the course does not spread to the family and to the extended family and to the community. So they have been even ostracized by their whole communities and be asked to leave if they refuse to get rid of their child. So are you saying religion has a very big part to play in some of these misconceptions? Yes, I mean, a misconception of religion, because uh, many times it's thought that even on, in the Bible, it's uh, sometimes re disability is referred to as a result of punishment, even though uh, Jesus clearly says it's not a result of sin. But this uh, misconception that is from biblical times is still very much present uh, in, uh, in other parts of uh, the world, not, not only in uh, Africa, also in Latin America, but particularly in Kenya. That's what we've seen. Hey, Moetene, let me come to you. What about religion? <laughs> um, I think religion is, I always see it as, you know, when you, it's something that's supposed to change our inside, change how we are in terms of our spirit, our soul, right? But I think when it comes to Africans, particularly, they use it more as a body lotion, so it sits on the skin. Um, and so, I mean, that's how I've been able to <laughs> explain it. But I think that it just doesn't allow people to accept um, particularly, I was going to say with you, Ms. Priscilla, it's in the Old Testament that it says that it's a sin. It's, it says it somewhere. And, and, and this is, you know, as, as our, our, our um, culture grows, religion mm -hmm. is a big part of our culture, particularly, particularly Nigerians. And so we don't want to believe that. There's always um, something wrong with the mom. I mean, I'm pretty sure my mother went through all that. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? But if, when we talk about advocacy, when we talk about education, 
Um, religion is not bad. It's not a bad thing. But in terms of implementing something that works, there's a, a lot of people go to church every Sunday. And if a pastor can begin a sermon, a service that, that encourages parents to accept your children, the changes will begin from there. You know, um, and so for my situation, uh, nobody wants to believe it. Everybody kept saying to me, oh, God, we do it. Oh, close your eye. Let me pray for you, yeah, so that the miracle can walk. I mean, I've gone through a lot of churches. I mean, I can tell you stories and stories of churches that I've been through. And someone would say, close your eyes. And then I close my eyes and they pray, 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 pray. And then I open my eyes. The things are still blurry. And then they tell me, oh, um, you, um, your faith is not weak. Uh, your faith is too weak. God can heal you. And I'm giving, giving you one story. So my father had just left. I was eight years old. The woman came to get me from the back of the church. She took me to um, take me, get me from the audience uh, where, um, where I was sitting, and she took me to the back of the church. And she had on a white board in front of me. And she said to me, I want you to, and she said to me, God is going to heal you today. So I heard you can't see. So I want you to stand and read me what you see on the board. And here I am, eight years old. I'm very fearful because I had gone through a lot of, you know, beating and stuff like that. So I'm very fearful, very afraid. So I remember standing in front of that board, and I couldn't see anything at all. And I just stood there because I was so afraid. I kept saying, oh, A, Q, B. And she goes, ah, is that B? Come on, open your eyes and read what you see. She kept yelling and yelling. And through the whole time, my eyes were open as wide as possible, and tears kept coming out of my eyes. But I wasn't crying. Um, it was just that it, she was making me do things that my eyes were not built to do. And we did that for about 20 minutes, and then she kept pushing me closer to the board. She's like, this is me, this is the board. To so the point where my nose was touching the board, and I still couldn't see what was on the board. And she goes, go away. God can't heal you because your faith is too weak. I was only eight, and I'm 31. I still remember those things. So I think that church is, um, is good, but we have to find a different way to do it. It's about changing the narrative. Um, and, and, and changing the narrative begin with using the information we have to tell a different story. And I believe that, and that's the work I do. Mm. Yeah. Priscilla, let me come to you. Yes. you. You have something to add? Yeah, I just okay, wanted sure. to add also about just uh, going on on the issue of religion. Uh, what we are also concerned is about the reaction of the church uh, towards people with disabilities. Uh -huh. We've seen that the church uh, has focused on creating um, orphanages or mm -hmm. homes for children right. with disabilities where they are often abused and we've also seen how uh, missionaries uh, from especially Europe and the US and Canada mm -hmm. and also churches from these countries are uh, sending money to these orphanages or actually creating these orphanages and this is actually creating an incentive to recruit children uh, with disabilities from vulnerable areas to put them in these institutions uh, so it's actually creating an incentive for segregation instead mm -hmm. of actual Thank supports you. and inclusion etc yeah so um, in terms of, of religion also how um, it's important to emphasize that uh, well-meaning churches and missionaries that are wanting to help these children the best way is not to do it through an orphanage because we've seen cases now of exploitation of children trying to keep them in the worst possible conditions and trying to actually get as many children as possible in an orphanage in abusive conditions to generate pity to generate also um, donations uh, for this for this uh, group home or yeah. so, so in, in these in some of these instances what has your group done to try to resolve some of these challenges mm -hmm. and do you engage the government to explain to them to perhaps give them more information in order for these policymakers to implement some of these uh, findings that you've come up with? Yes, uh, so in 2018 we published a report, a very comprehensive report on our findings that mainly focused on the stigma and infanticide of children with disabilities and then it went into the segregation of these children in either at home in the best case scenarios or actually in, in abusive institutions. Mm -hmm. And then we also set, uh, put a clear set of recommendations to the government in this report and we met with government officials and we explained to them uh, our findings and um, we know that there are some efforts right now to start the institutionalization process in Kenya and we have great allies on the ground already making advancements there is a wonderful organization called Tahili uh, they are closing down orphanages and uh, putting their, taking their children back to their families and using the donations to support the families instead of uh, them going to to the directors of institutions. Um, but there is still a lot to be done, and uh, this, this, um, now a lot of funding, international
national funding is going particularly to Kenya to close institutions. Uh, our plea is that children with disabilities are not left behind because we've seen in Eastern Europe and in other countries that when orphanages are being closed, children with disabilities are the ones who stay in the institutions. Mm. Berhani, let me come to you in Ethiopia. When it comes to religion, uh, have you experienced situations like we, we've heard and how do you overcome them? Yes, of course, from time to time we hear these kinds of similar experiences like other African countries. Now the most important thing is like we try to give alternatives. When I say alternatives, like how religious institutes can accommodate uh, people with disability needs and in what way that they can support. Uh, one of the things that is really changing is that in having children with disability in an inclusive schools, there, is, there are uh, a lot of uh, support services that are coming from religious institutes, including Catholic and the Orthodox churches, but most of the things are done in special needs education context. That means uh, children with disabilities, like for example, children with blindness, deaf children, they have their own schools. That's what we want to change. And religious institutions are also another burden in the society, like when parents have children uh, with disability and they take to the pastors or to the priests and they assume that this is our curses or the sins of the family. These are the things that we can change over time through education. It cannot happen overnight, but through the advocacy work of our member organization at the different parts of the country, these attempts are being done. One of the things that our member organization in Ethiopia is doing is that every year when they are doing the IDPD, the International uh, Day of Persons with Disability Celebration, is that they are doing it in different parts of the country to uh, sensitize the community and see disability as a diversity of humanity. Let, let me come to you, Susan. There have been instances where during the International Day to observe people living with disabilities, you have government officials making big speeches, making promises, but they don't follow through. How do you hold them accountable? How do you engage them to be, you know, to live up to the promises and some of the uh, engagement they said they are going to do? Yeah, like I said, we should uh, continue to be the people speaking on behalf of these children because I believe that uh, as, uh, the more we push it, the more we speak about it, the more we say, uh, government, this is who we are, these are the children, they need attention, uh, eventually they are going to do it. Eventually they are going to um, uh, put in policy for these children. Uh, I think it's up to us not to give up, you know, not to give up because there's so much happening, you know, in, in the government, not disability um, alone, not uh, uh, so many challenges in education, in health care, in, uh, uh, in, in community. But we need we people who believe that we need, the government need to intervene, we shouldn't give up. Uh, I believe, uh, I remember this year we had the first African uh, conference on autism in Nairobi. And it was, we are over 21 countries, you know, all Africans. And we had so many people, uh, educators, researchers, uh, therapists, doctors from all over, you know, the world. But the question was, what next? What are we going to do after getting all this information? It's not only the information, but we need resources. So it's here, you know, we go from this point to this point. Like I said, we are pushing for a hearing in the parliament. You know, we are going to have these children, we are going to have the parents, the doctors, the therapists to come and speak and say this is who we are, this is what we need. Education, their, uh, uh, their part is missing. The, uh, the teachers are not trained enough. And how are the government going to intervene when we can't speak, when we can't all of us come together and support these children and be their voice. Again, it needs us to keep speaking, to keep getting the government involved. They are not going to do it alone. We need, we need to speak, we need to show them this is where 
we need your help. So uh, the government is a big entity. I mean, there's so much. But if they see us coming along, saying, you know what, especially autism, it's being ignored. And, and you know, uh, one thing we need to keep uh, doing as uh, the PAC at the Pan-African Conference on Autism going around African countries, next year we are going to Ghana. And we expect a lot of change. We expect a lot of Africans, government, you know, sending people repre to represent you. Minister of Health, Minister of Education, you know, we cannot do it alone. So, as we continue to speak and expect change, I think we should come together and be the voice. And definitely the government will intervene. But, but Susan, in the case of autism, there's supposedly no known cure for it and in some instances depending on how extreme it is on the on the spectrum parents or institutions would have to take care of some of these individuals living with autism for the rest of their lives how are parents able to cope with such situations and what do you do for them going forward again if we introduce um the early childhood intervention in schools. You know, let the children be assessed at the early uh, age. Let the parents know, okay, this is what's happening with my child. You know, I, I've, I have so many parents, you know, who are struggling in this area. But all we are doing is take, you know, a, a, a day, take a, a stage, you know, uh, as it is. Young children, of course, children begin to speak at the age of three, you know, some too. So when we recognize that these children need help in their speech, then we know where to take them as they grow. I work with young adults with autism, 18 years and above. We have so many activities for them. And these are the same things we are planning for our African, you know, children who are struggling with autism. We need to implement. When the children are, you know, young adults, we know there are some who are high functioning. We create jobs for them. We do, uh, we take them out in the community. They, they, they can volunteer in different places. So uh, I've seen uh, with my experience speaking to the parents and bringing these children a big change. You know, uh, it's also a relief to bring these children into a safer place. You know, like New Life Foundation, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, children and parents who have really uh, appreciated the change in their children and what we see. So it takes us, again, to be creative. Mm -hmm. Eventually, I mean, there is no medication. There is no, um, uh, we don't think they are going to, uh, uh, there is cure, but there are things, there are these children are well, you know, skilled. They are computer uh, uh, skilled. We can create things. Again, it comes back to us to create activities for them, to cre create a better place, uh, be, be creative, uh, be, uh, uh, um, be creative and reach out to different organizations, you know, like the way we do here. Uh, I believe we have all resources in Africa. It's just that we are not, uh, uh, this particular uh, disability is not put in place or there are no structure, you know, under system. Let, let, me, come, let me come to you, Berhanu. In your advocacy work, what are some of the positive signs you're seeing in changing hearts and minds to, regarding the uh, misconceptions, prejudices and, uh, and the likes? Look, for, uh, first of all, most of our advocacy work that we do is towards the duty bearer, governments and other stakeholders. So the most important thing is like for us, they should understand the diversity within disability because there is a misconception. When you talk about disability, it's only about uh, people with physical disability or blindness or deafness. But there are other uh, specific issues that we need also to tackle depending on the uh, the constituency that we are working around that includes for example autism what our sister has been discussing now and also the issue of 
people with psychosocial disability, all these things. So the first and the most important thing is that we discuss about the diversity of persons with disability. We are seeing a lot of changes. Even when we are sitting with the government or the different stakeholders, now they recognize the differences between the different types of disability. And they want to mainstream issues of disability in their action plan, in their work. The most important and significant change that we are seeing is that most African countries now, uh, due to the Agenda 2030 or the, S uh, the SDG commitment that they have, when they do their national development plans, now they are putting issues of persons with disabilities into consideration. This is due to continuous advocacy and engagement with the governments. So I really want to recognize the national governments on one day when what they are trying to do. But still, we are missing a lot of things and a lot have to be done. Let me come to you, um, Priscilla. Some people have said to me that people living with disabilities or groups advocating on behalf of people living with disabilities need strong allies, both in government and out of government, uh, corporations and organizations, institutions, to help push your agenda forward to ensure that governments engage uh, to resolve some of these challenges day-to-day -day people living with disabilities have in their daily lives. So what do you make of that? Yeah, I definitely agree. Uh, we've seen how often advocates are also face threats from the government when they speak up. Uh, so it's helpful to have allies who are able to, for instance, international allies. That's, that's, that's our main role in, uh, in Africa, particularly in Kenya, is to be the international uh, support to these advocates who are doing such courageous work mm -hmm. and were able to say things in a, possibly in a more open way than they are because we are able to come and go, uh, whereas they are the ones who stay. So uh, we've, we've always worked in countries that way we are the international ally and we work with local partners doing great work and also because um, we focus a lot on international advocacy so engaging UN committees uh, the United, Na United Nations committees regional uh, also human rights bodies um, that are able to keep the pressure on the government and to also to keep the public eye and the international also um, media if possible on the government to ensure that they make the necessary changes and that they ensure that the rights of children and adults with disabilities are respected. Well, some of the things you've seen here in some Western countries is that some of these people living with disabilities are skilled, they are highly trained, but elsewhere they are not being engaged, they are not being hired. Uh, Mutanya, can you tell me some experiences that you've heard or um, seen in, in, in the past? Absolutely. Before I come to you, Priscilla. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so for me, I'm a visual story storyteller. Um, and so, and I, meaning that I tell stories with images and videos. Um, now, if I were to be back home, however, it would have been something very different. I mean, I don't know because n the resources are, were, were not there when I was growing up. And so no one would have known what I was good at. Now, I'm a talkative. That's my mother's nickname for me. Um, so eventually, they I would have ended up telling stories or something like that. But I have also, um, you know, in, in the U.S., um, rather, because this is where I live now, um, there are, I've worked with autism, um, a group of um, um, children living with um, autism, and they, some of them are very good with computers. Um, a lot of them are very good with video games. I mean, these are different skill sets. But in order for you to be able to know what the children are good at, you have to be able to um, uh, give them the proper uh, examination to determine mm -hmm. what, what it is that they have and to also pay attention to the child. Um, um, there was a, a time I had gone to see a friend and the son was on the ground. I mean, he was playing. And so the mom at the time was like beating the child. Like, you know, I told you to sit here. You're not sitting here. Sit here. So it kind of it shifted in my brain that, oh, this mother doesn't even know that the, there was something wrong with the child, but the woman doesn't know there's something wrong with the child. So she's trying to straighten him up with the rest of the other, because the other kids are behaving well, so she's trying to make sure that this her son behaves like the other child. So I said to her, I said, your son probably has, like, you know, is, um, among the uh, 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 autism spectrum, mm -hmm. so it's best that you go and figure out what's wrong with the son bef instead of, like, trying to force him to do something that you know he can't do. Mm -hmm. So I think there are, there are lots of, we're very skilled, and, and, and disability is very diverse. Mine is 
not obvious to most people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there are people who they walk in here and you can tell there's something off or something wrong or something not going well with them. And, and also disability, there isn't, it's like people are born with it and people acquire it as they get at some point in their lives, right? But it's, it's very important that the, um, there's, there's a sense of, um, that we have to assess and figure out what it is that people are good at. I had to learn that over time because when I got my college degree, I couldn't do any regular jobs. I couldn't see computers. The first job I had, I remember um, walking into that place and, um, and then I couldn't see anything on the screen. Um, and it was like a Rite Aid job, you know, it was, I have to scan people's information, blah, blah, blah. I couldn't see it, and I broke down in tears. You know, I called my mother, I said, Mommy, I can't see, because now my fear is that I'm going to be a burden to my family, mm -hmm. which I don't want to. So oh, from 21 to about 30, I kept losing jobs because I was being placed at a, a job that I just could not do and no one knew how to help me. So I had to do a process of elimination myself to figure out, okay, what are your skill set? You know, you're a great storyteller, you, you know how to talk, you know how to engage people. Okay, so how about you start telling stories and you love journalism, so you can start to focus on that. So I began to spend a lot of my time reading and attending classes so that way I can sharpen my um, storytelling skills. And so I think it takes uh, parents to do that kind of work with their children, starting from when they're younger, so that way you're able to push them into, towards the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, and that's my answer to you. Pr Priscilla, let me come to you. Yeah, uh, I think that's a great question. There is a United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, mm -hmm. and one of the driving mottos behind that convention uh, from advocates with disabilities was nothing about us without us. So the convention clearly recognizes that anything that has to do with disability, from policy to legislation to any mm -hmm. action, needs to include people with disabilities. And that means that they need to be trained and they need to be also um, uh, they need to understand and they need to be part of what's happening, uh, what's being discussed. So um, part of what Disability Rights International has been doing uh, in the, around the world, Turkey and Mexico particularly, is training people with disabilities and, and also particularly people with psych psychosocial disabilities or psychiatric disabilities uh, because they are some of the most marginalized, um, one, is one of the most marginalized groups within the uh, disability um, population. So uh, it's, yeah, it's key. It's key that uh, we understand our responsibility to ensure that people with disabilities, not only in the West, but everywhere, are trained and are given the tools to be advocates and to be sitting at the table where discussions exactly. are happening. Well, well, Susan, let me come to you briefly. Uh, do you have anything to add before we leave? Yeah, um, one thing I would love to say is uh, let's up, keep up what we are doing and be the voice to these children and uh, for the last four years I've been pushing it and I really see a big change so yes we can do the, the we can have all this education uh, training but then we need hands-on we need resources we need to uh, actually uh, those who can go to Africa yeah you know go to Africa be on the ground look at the problem and solve it and I believe um, with all us coming together, you know, disability, you know, whichever it is, uh, these children are going to be better and we will make a better, you know, Africa. All right. Th thank you. Berhani, let me come to you briefly. Ten seconds. Okay. I, I'm just going to mention quickly about the guiding principle of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, which is equal opportunity for all people with disability. And that is really important. If we have that starting from uh, early childhood development and access to education and provide a lifelong learning opportunities, I'm sure we can... All right, th thank you very society. much, Berhanu. On that note, today's outstanding guests were Priscilla Rodriguez, Imuatingan Ugagbe, Priscilla Quezera, and Berhanu Tefera Kizau. Thanks to our audience for tuning in to Straight Talk Africa. Until next time, good evening, Africa.